Herbert Green was the one who, who, who actually found Chuck, but he wasn't there to see Chuck. He, he was there to see somebody else, right? And, and, uh, and, and what happened? Give me kind of the, 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 the genesis for how you ended up starting to recruit Charles Sonny. Well, Herbert had been going to that school, and he was recruiting a kid. Uh, what was his name, Charles? Travis Abernathy. Travis Abernathy. And then Charles went to see him. I mean, Herbert went to see uh, Herbert Abernathy, and Charles just tore somebody all, uh, up all alive. <laughs> and he changed on Abernathy and went to Charles. And he spent the rest of his time recruiting Charles. Everybody says, old Sonny recruited Charles. Old, old Sonny didn't recruit Charles. Herbert. Herbert Green recruited Charles and Jan, I think. What do you think about that? <laughs> you know, I, can you hear me, Charles? I can. Uh, you, you know, Jeff, it's a hundred percent true story. Uh, they started out recruiting Travis, mm -hmm. who was, who was, uh, he's a relative and a next door neighbor. Okay. And, tra and Travis was a hell of a player. And we, we didn't know who Herbert was, obviously. And he, he, so we saw him at a few games because, you know, the thing was, you know, I went, I grew from 5'10 to 6'5 in one year. So I had never gotten a letter yeah. until I was a senior. Travis had been getting letters as a freshman. Really? Yeah. So, um, and Travis is the first person in the history of my high school to go from the junior high straight to the varsity. Wow. That's how good a player he was. So, uh, obviously, I didn't know who Herbert was, and finally the coach says, "Hey, I'm here to look at Travis Abernathy." And then a few, a few more games, he says, "You know, my coach says, hey, Charles, uh, I think Auburn wants to look at you now.'" And I said, "That'll be awesome, coach." And, and that's how the and uh, that's how the story goes. You you can't yeah. drop out of Bobby Lee Hurt, is that right? I yeah, was you know you know you know that. So this is what happened. So I told you. This is going into Christmas. So like I say, I'm already, I'm, I'm a 5'10 backup point guard my whole life. And I grow to 6'4", 6'4 yeah. and a half. But I still, like, I'm only getting a couple letters from like junior colleges. So Bobby Lee is the best big man in the country. Uh, they're ranked number one, uh, 4A. We're ranked number one, 3A. Uh, he's 6'11". So people thought like I could only play small school. So against Bobby Lee, I had 30 points and 20 rebounds. Yep. And that that changed that changed everything in my life, Jeff. I, I, I like to say I didn't get no big time schools, yep. but from that point on, they're like, maybe he can play division one. Yeah, that's true. And what happened in that game that sold me, I was there for that game. The ball went up on the board, and Charles went up and got it with two hands and threw it to mid court before he hit the floor. And I said, I've never seen anybody else ever do that except Wes Hunt. And I knew right there that uh, this was a real deal right there. He, he was going to be something. And he so turned out to do that. It, it came down. I mean, it kind of came down. Everybody thought you were going to go to UAB, Chuck. And, and then you ended up, it was you, it was Auburn, Alabama and, uh, and Sonny versus Wimp, which man, listen, that, that's a whole podcast unto itself, if we got Sonny and Wimp together, right? Uh, well, it, it, you know, I got really lucky making a good decision going to Auburn. So, uh, you know, I was really close to my mother and grandmother. They came to every game I played, and they were going to still – they came down to Auburn to every home game. So UAB is only like 25 minutes from my house. And Alabama's like an hour. Auburn's two hours. So, uh, so, so I'm trying to decide. So I'm looking at UAB. UAB made it to the Sweet 16 that year. Okay. And they had everybody coming back. So then I go, I look at Alabama. Alabama actually made it to the Sweet 16. And they signed Ennis Wiley, who was the number one point guard in the country from Birmingham. Sure. And Bobby Lee, who was the best big man in the country from Alabama also. So I'm like, wow. And obviously, you know, I'm not Charles Barkley at this point. I don't have great confidence. So then I go down to Auburn, and I'm looking around. I don't even remember the game I went to. And it was a, a pretty good game, if I remember correctly. 
And I said, I think I can play with these guys. And I remember when I got back home, I told my mother and grandmother, I said, hey, guys, I know it's the farthest school away. But I said, the most important thing is I want an opportunity to play. And I said, I'm going to go to Auburn. And my grandmother said, Charles, it's your decision. We don't mind driving two hours. Because my grandmother, as Sonny knows, my grandmother is probably the most important person in my life. And she no, says, we don't, mind, we don't mind driving two hours. And, and I was sold after that. Sonny, did you try to tell him that, that Auburn was actually closer to his house in Alabama? Is that true? Well, but the road, <laughs> there was a road you could take. It wasn't real wide, but you could go up over the mountain and you could take an hour off at about 45 minutes and you'd come out in Silicon. And uh, I had convinced uh, his grandmother that it was closer to Auburn over the mountain than it was to Tuscaloosa going by the highway. And she believed it and I believed it. I wasn't lying to her. You could have done that. Uh, I don't remember the name of that road and it might have been rock. I'm not sure. Gravel, maybe. <laughs> Hey, how, how good a salesman was he, Charles? Well, to me, he number one, he really – because it, it, I really like Gene Bartow as a person. Wimp was probably the, the least one. I didn't learn about Wimp until later, what a good guy he was. But Gene Bartow, uh, I, I really liked him. But I say, I, but, but I would say it was really a Homer thing. Like, yo, man, I, I want my mother and grandmother not to drive far. 20 minutes. But, yeah. one, but, one, but once I went down to Auburn, man, I was sold. Uh, I was really sold. Why? What? Yeah, what? Charles, what? tell him what you did on your first 30 minutes or more, 40 minutes or more on your visit to Auburn. I don't remember. What happened? You spent it with Jan. You wouldn't go Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you, you know, Sonny so, so, has the greatest wife ever. You know, you talk about, like, First of all, well, I don't think kids understand. I tell kids two things. Man, when you go to college, the number one thing is playing time. Yeah. The second thing is you're so homesick. Well, I remember the first time, uh, the first time I went to college, Jeff, I told my family, you know, I'm talking like a big old dude. Hey, I'll see you guys in a couple months um, when this thing, uh, when I get settled and everything. Thank Man, you. that first Hey, that first weekend when Sonny let me go, I was home in like an hour and 22 minutes. I was driving 100 miles an hour the whole way. <laughs> um, you, get, you get homesick, but you're around, <laughs> you're around random strangers, and you, it, it, it takes a while. But Miss Smith, man, she treated us all like sons. Um, you know, and listen, I, I, I don't give a shit about the NCAA. You know, Sonny had us over to dinner every now and then, and she was like the sweetest lady. And it was so awesome to have like a mother figure like close to you. What, 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 yeah, what? Think, one thing, Jeff, before you get off of that, Jan had a stroke, uh, severe stroke, devastating stroke at uh, 47, Jan, I, I, for, at 47. The first person to the hospital when they put her in a bed was Charles. Charles was the first one there, and Chuck Person was the second player there. And that that that's always jumped out at us about how much they thought about Jan. Well, I, listen, I, I know, and, and while we're on that topic, Sonny, we'll, we'll, we'll go there. I was going to go there a little bit later. But, but about Chuck the Person, I think people know by now a little bit about how giving he is, about what a what – a, human being and, and the character and all that the, the people that see you on tv chuck they don't they don't know that right they think one thing of you but i've seen it i've seen it with me i've seen it with other people when he's walking through hotels and he's dripping at the final four i mean literally dripping and he signs he, he stops and he, and he signs autographs he sits there and talks I mean, I don't know how you get anywhere chuck like you must be well like, listen hey everybody. jeff i gotta give dr g all the credit for that Really? You know, the two, Dr. J helped me a lot as a man. And Moses is the most important figure in my basketball career. But Dr. J, you know, that's the one thing I hate about the NBA today. Like, when you go to the NBA today, the oldest guy on the team is, like, 22. Yeah. You know, he's been in the league, like, three or four years, and he's only 22. Nobody knows anything at 22. But when I got to the NBA, 
Moses, Doc, those guys were like 36. So they taught and do, and Doc taught me, yo man, yep. you're gonna make a lot of money. Always sign autographs, always take pictures, and like and so I'm watching Doc. This is I'm a I'm a nobody rookie at the time. Yep. And Dr. J is Dr. J. Anytime we're going through the hotel, he's signing every autograph. Really? He's taking every picture. And I'm studying him. Then finally, you know, when we get to know each other, I said, Doc, why do you do all that stuff? You know, he said, Chuck, that's part of the game. That's part of it. You ain't, they're not paying you all that money to just play basketball. You're going to, you're going to get interrupted at dinner, you go, but sign autographs and take pictures. But the one thing he taught me, Jeff, and this is the most important thing, even when you say no, you got to make it in a way that you make the person don't feel little. Yep. Yep. Like, like sometimes I'll say, listen, man, I, 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 want, I really apologize. You know, it's too many people here. Uh, uh, I'm trying to watch this game or I'm trying to have drinks with my friends. I'm not trying to be an asshole. I just can't start signing autographs because if I sign one, everybody's going to keep coming. And that's probably the biggest lesson he taught me. Even when you say no, yep. just make the person feel like you don't, you just don't, you don't want to belittle them. And that, and that, that actually has been a great thing for me. Yeah. No, I think that's what people, they appreciate it. Right. I mean, ultimately they appreciate you being real with them. And I think that's the one thing. Listen, the, the first time you don't remember this, First time you and I met, probably like eight years ago, something like that, whenever the, the, the Final Four was in uh, Indy, so it had to be like seven, eight years ago, and uh, I was at ESPN, a colleague of mine called me and said, hey, come over, they got this party in the back of, of this restaurant, a lot of ESPN producers here, I was in my, maybe my second year, just finished my first year at ESPN, and uh, Tony Romo's here, Barkley's here, just come on over, we'll drink, whatever. I walk in that restaurant, I walk in the back, and all of a sudden you're walking towards me. And I grew up as a Sixers fan in Boston. I told Chuck this. My favorite player growing up was Andrew Tony. I can't even say that shit around here or I'll get lynched. So I walk <laughs> to the back, and Chuck comes up to me, and he's like, hey, man, I, I really respect, I really like what you do. Charles Barkley introduces himself. I'm like, is somebody fucking punking me here? Like, what the fuck's going on? And... Uh, <laughs> But it meant a lot to me. It did. It meant a lot to me that you would do that. And and, and since uh, I feel like, again, you're that way with everyone. You're that way with everybody. Well, you know, Jeff, in the words of Dr. J, we're all in this thing together, literally in the middle of a pandemic. But in sports, like, it's gotten adversarial in the last, you know, 30-some years because guys are looking to tweet stuff trying to get clickbait. But when we started, when I started, I talked to the press every day, after every game, after every practice. Now I hear guys like, hey, I don't talk uh, on off days or I'm only gonna talk to you after games. I'm like, yo man, this is not adversarial. Right. Now if a guy writes something, you can number one, call him on it, or you have the right not to speak to him. But I look at all the media guys, we're in this thing together. I want basketball to do good. Right. Like, I never wake up saying, let me say bad something bad about a player. So guys like yourself, when I meet you, like, yo, man, we're in the same business. And I wish the young guys today would understand that. Like, you guys are trying to do y'all job. And our job, y'all, our job is to make each other's job easier. <laughs> And we're all for the sport. We're all for the same damn thing, right? We all want the sport, whether it's it's NBA, whether it's college, whether it's AAU. We all want it. We're all in it for the same reasons. None of us got in it to make money. We got in it because we love it. Whatever angle we're doing, coaching, media, playing, whatever it is, I, I think that's what gets lost. And these kids today, I get it. They, they have a brand. They can put it out there themselves with Twitter. They don't need us or they feel like they don't need us. And, and I understand it, Chuck, because anybody can be a so-called media person now. Anybody can start a blog. Anybody can yeah. put on Twitter. So I understand it, and it pisses me off because I think the industry has gone to shit because of that. I do. Yes. I there are a lot of people out there that are just <laughs> in it for clicks. 
that are just in it and they don't have the training to actually, you know, go through what I went through. I mean, I interviewed James Worthy when he, when I was 13 years old. I, I knew I wanted to do this. I knew I wasn't going to be good enough. So I learned the right way how to, how to do it. And, and I'm not going to kill any kid in high school. Hell no. I'm probably not going to kill any kid in college for the most part. Once they get to the NBA, that's a different deal for me. I agree. You know, they're making money then. They're making money. It's a job then. But in college, yeah. I'm going to protect the kid as much as I humanly can. Like right now, they're killing Zion, right? They're killing Zion. This story out there that, you know, his family's being sued by – and people are saying, well, did Duke know all this? Listen, I'm not coming to any conclusions on this. Until I know more information, why would I? Well, you know, it's interesting. I've been obviously paying attention to the Zion thing. Uh, Man, there's – why would a company, you know, go to an 18-year-old kid and try to get him to sign? I mean, obviously we knew Zion was going to be a star, but, yeah. man, there's so many people trying to get in your pocket. Like, this company, they should be held like, why are y'all trying to sign an 18-year-old kid? No, you know? That's right. That's right. I mean, I know he's going to make a lot of money in the future, but you should not be able to sign a – an 18-year-old should not be able to sign a contract with some company, period. But, it, but it's – listen, it's – I was going back. How different was it all when you were coming up? And, again, like you said, you blew up kind of late, right? So it wasn't like you were at 15 years old. Everybody knew who Charles Barkley was like they did with Zion. But how different was the whole landscape? Sonny, you can talk to this too, probably even, even more appropriately. Um, how different was the landscape of recruiting then with, with some of the restrictions that are on now? And w was it dirtier then? I think it has always been uh, – recruiting with a scholarship has never been the right statement to make. Somewhere along the line, every kid at, at every school has received something. And – I think the best thing to do is if say if you were involved in recruiting years ago, base it on need, not what they want. Does that make sense? Yep. And if you, I think the people that go over into the Walt area are the people that uh, hurt recruiting and made it a bad thing. But uh, uh, for instance, we had a guy, we had a guy that was in the clothing business. If a kid came to Auburn, years ago and didn't have any clothes, this guy somehow made sure they got clothes. And not, and not overly, an unknowable amount, but uh, uh, that kind of thing, I would, I would turn my head all the way around for that kind of thing. And Charles knows that also. But uh, the cars and all that kind of thing, uh, that, that ballooned it into a different animal, really, it really did. Well, you know, it's interesting, you know, you know, Jeff, I'm paying attention to the Bowen thing. Yeah. And his mom and dad, <laughs> like, they got, they're suing them saying they, they requested and demanded all this money from Adidas. See, that's to me when it gets out of hand, when the people around you are trying to profit. Listen, God rest my mother and grandmother's soul. But ain't nowhere in the hell they would ever said hey, my son ain't coming to your school unless you give him X amount of money. And when I'm reading about the Bowen kid, his dad yeah. is saying, no, you got to give us X amount of money or he ain't coming to your school. That's what bothers me uh, about the whole thing. Um, because I've said this, I think that they should be able to borrow money from some an agent that would help a level playing field. No. Yeah, like, say, if I want to, because kids are leaving school because they don't have any money. But let's say you went to a small school and you want to stay. Say, hey, let me borrow money from an agent. I'm going to pay him back. Right. I know I'm going to uh, get it in two years. I know I'm going to have it. Right. Yes. But, like, the way they – and first of all, the NCAA, they full of crap, too. Listen, some of this stuff they've been doing, going back – uh, suspending guys for getting too many sneakers. Right. Ridiculous. Guy, uh, suspending guys for having lunch with somebody. Playing in Mark, programs, playing in yeah, a yeah. game. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark, Mark Emmert has got to grow up and realize, like, wait, 
I'm just spending a guy like the kid who's probably going to be a top three or four pick what Wiseman. Yeah. Like Penny lent him five thousand dollars like seven years ago. I'm like, wait, this guy's going to be a top ten pick. He's going to be great for college basketball, and y'all going to suspend him. And then then the kids like, screw it. And right. see, you see what you see what's happening now. These kids and and I hate the fact that they're going to the G League. Yeah, I do. Uh, I think uh, I think it'd be great for these kids to go to college. Cause you think about this. Look how much money Zion made for six months in college. You know, uh, and, and this kid and people. And I, and see, this is why I always laugh. People don't have a clue about money. It's like, well, this kid got five hundred thousand dollars. I said he did. I said, well, first of all, he didn't get $500,000. After taxes. He go, yeah, I said, first of all, after he paid taxes, number one, it's going to be under 300000 closer to 200000 Then he got to pay his agent. And then I knew the NBA had a trick. I knew the NBA. I said, wait a minute. The NBA, they got a trick going on somewhere trying to get these kids to come to the G League. Number one, number, number two, and number three, you notice they didn't release the mother two guys' salary. They made they made a big deal when they was giving the like one kid five. Yeah, it's like two yeah. So yeah. So he's but, gonna but, make you know, I say it's yeah. him, it's like a hundred and fifty clear. Yeah, but the thing is though, you think about this though. Yep. So the NBA, I was thinking like, listen, I know the NBA, they're a good businessman. They're not gonna have these kids playing in uh Fort Wayne, Indiana and Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I'm like, there's a trick coming somewhere. And then they're gonna put they they gonna start a different select team in LA, and have guys who are high profile play in LA. I'm like, that explains it, but that makes it even worse because number one they're gonna have all these other quote guys who ain't never gonna touch the NBA playing these small teams. Yep. They gonna have the the best of the best playing in LA. But how far you think that hundred thousand, two hundred thousand gonna go in LA? Because we're talking 17, 18 year old kids. They gonna have to bring mom and dad Got or it. somebody That's else. Right. Yep. And I'm like, wait, that five hundred thousand is gone already. <laughs> I, said, I would, yeah. I would love, I would have, I would love to see my if it's my kid. I'm like, wait, that five hundred thousand dollars is gone, and I'm living in LA, and I uprooted everybody in my life. I said, no, no, no. Let me go to Auburn, Duke, North Carolina, Kansas, Michigan State. They gonna get three squares a day. I know what they at every night. I mean, that friends. to me. And they got friends forever. I mean, Chuck, you got friends from Auburn. I guarantee today that again, if you went to this G League developmental program, really, I mean, yeah, Jalen Green might have Isaiah Todd, might have Dayshan Nix, the kid going who is going to go to UCLA. I, I just don't get Adam Silver's why. The big thing to me is why, Charles. Because the agents are scumbags. They're trying to get these kids to the second contract. What people don't understand, you don't make a ton. Well, you make great money on your first contract. But the sooner you get to that second contract, that's when you make $150 million or more. And that's when you're set for life. The agents don't care about the good of the NBA or the good of college. They just want their money. Is this uh, hey, Jeff. Go ahead, son. Yep. All, I gave, all I gave Charles was books, board, tuition, and fees, and laundry money. But the laundry brought in $800 a month. How much? <laughs> 800 a month for laundry? Hey. Damn. Hey, hey, hey Jeff, uh, I, I, I tell Sonny, I tell Sonny this, the same thing I tell Bruce Pearl. I says, at Auburn, we don't get McDonald's all American. We get guys who eat at McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, give, give me, uh, like I said, I, I got a few things for you. I got a couple couple things. Did my research, you know, my reporter kind of, you know, asked oh, yeah. around a little bit. So rumor has it uh, that Charles had somebody from the staff walking him to class every single day. True, hey. false. True. <laughs> Mac McCarthy. Matt McCarthy was the first person I had that was in charge of it. He would make sure that Charles got to the door. Charles would go in one door and out the other one. Matt never did catch it. Hey. Is that true or not? Hey, hey, Jeff, that's true. I still talk to Mac all the time. <laughs> and, we jo and, hey, and we joke about it all the time. And I said, hey, man. Y'all already told me I got to lead the SEC in rebounding. I'm leading the SEC in rebounding. That's good enough for me. 
That's going to get you a C. <laughs> that's going to get a C in every class. That's okay. We go another game, Jeff. That'll get me a C in every class. Fine, right? That's good. Eligibility. We had that thing called eligibility. How did you keep Charles eligible? How did, besides that, how hard how hard was he to deal with? Immature Charles. I can only imagine what he was like as a freshman yeah. in Auburn. Well, the only thing I can say about that is that he didn't understand me and I didn't understand him. So it was two guys that didn't understand <laughs> trying to get along with one another. <laughs> is that hey. anywhere near close to Charles? You know, Jeff. Sonny is one of the most important people in my life. You know, I love him like a father. He's been great to me. Uh, I was not mature enough for, for him getting on me. It, it took, uh, I didn't learn till I learned from Moses Malone about getting in shape and things like that. But Sonny, to his credit, he was hard on me. I was too immature. You know, because, you know, you're like, I'm saying to myself, Yo, man, I'm a freshman leading the SEC and rebounding. Yeah. I must be doing something right. And Sonny's like, no, you can do a lot better. But, like, I'm like, what's better than leading the SEC and rebounding <laughs> as a freshman? <laughs> so you what, you used to go up and, and, and tell him you were going to transfer? You'd go up to his office? And, no, and no, no, no. So uh, at the end of my sophomore year, I had had enough. <laughs> I had had enough. <laughs> and I said, yo, man, I've been here for two years. We lead, I'm lead, I've been here two years. Because I led the league in rebounding all three years I was in college. And I said, coach, I just had enough. I'm going to transfer. Blah, 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 blah. So then I calmed down. I go to his house. And we sit down, me, him, and Jan, and we have dinner, and we sit down and talk about basketball. And I say to him, and like I say, why don't you just tell me I'm doing good sometime? And, and yeah, I, like, yeah, I said, yeah. I said, I, said I, I, I know I'm doing good, but you, and like, but he wanted me to be a great player. And that goes back to my immaturity. I'm like, you know, I'm doing pretty good, but he, no, he wanted me to be better. And yeah. I wasn't mature enough to understand it. And after we, and that dinner lasted, I mean, we talked for like three or four hours. And from that day on, we've been great. Uh, yeah. He's like, I just want you to be the, uh, the best player. And from that day on, Jeff, it's been amazing. Let me add something here to that, Jeff. I, as a coach, I had never coached a superstar. I had never coached a player that was above the rest of the players that I had. I had always coached guys that you had to make better and hope that you could get by with them. Uh, I never had a player as good as Charles. And I look back on it, if I had been, if I had known how to coach a superstar, and that's what he was. He was a superstar off the court and on the court. Most sellable persons ever been at Auburn in basketball, probably in every sport. But I didn't know how to do that because I'd never coached anything but high school kids that weren't great. And I didn't have I didn't have but one good player that was with pro potentials on the team when Charles came. And we went through about four practices and he was down to a high school player again. So as Charles blocked every shot he took. <laughs> Errol Lockhart, do you remember that? And I, yeah. I, Charles, I say, Charles, he's the second best player on this team. Don't block his shot. I've got to have, I've got to have him be ready to play. Charles didn't, Charles didn't understand that one at all. Daryl had a hard time. Hey, uh, Jeff, the two greatest statements I've heard from coaches, and Coach just told me this. He tells me every time he sees me, he says, I figured out, I don't, he says, I, he, his motto was we always I treat all my players the same and he said what he said about me being really good in college he says my players the same no I can treat them all the same but I can treat you different that's what he, I should have done I didn't do it yeah and, yeah. and, and, and Greg Popovich said this to me one time I said coach when did Kawhi Leonard become a great player 
And he says, when he realized that when I called a play for him, it was for the Spurs to score, not for him to score. And I said, what? He says, yeah, Charles, a lot of guys think just because you call their play, they have to shoot the ball. It's really – and when Sonny's – and listen, I've talked to um, Bill Cower. We talked about it because uh, we were talking about Chip Kelly one day when he cut all his players he didn't like. Yeah. <laughs> he says, and he says, hey, somebody better tell Chip Kelly you don't get to coach just the players you like. There's players who are assholes that you just have to deal with. Because remember, he got rid of Deshaun Jackson, oh, yeah. uh, M- LaShawn McCoy, and I was doing the CBS. Uh, I made an appearance once a year on CBS, and Coach Cower, who I love, pulled me aside. He says, hey, you need to get to your boy in Philly and tell him, hey, you don't have to like every player. We don't treat all the players the same. You know, you, you, you remember the famous story about Jimmy Johnson when the player fell asleep and <laughs> Jimmy Johnson cut him? And the, and the reporter says, well, what if I'd have been Troy or Emmett? He says, I'd have woke them up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's the truth. <laughs> you, you only hey. average – how many shots a game did you average in, in, your, in your career at Auburn? Not that many. You didn't – you just went and got the ball. Did you care? Did you care about that and want more plays run for you, or were you okay with just going and getting it? No, I was okay with just – like, cause that's how I made my game. I averaged 20 rebounds a game in high school. I was – listen, when I found out – because, number one, it, it, college is not like the pros where they give you stats all the time. Yeah. I remember I think I might have been halfway through the season uh, or, or, or and they're like, you know, you lead the SEC and rebound. I'm like, what? And that just stoked my fire. I mean, I don't even – listen, because in high school, I was like the fourth option. So I got all my baskets on rebounds. And then when I got to Auburn, I found out I was leading the SEC in rebound. I didn't care. I mean, I think the most points I averaged in college were like 14. Yeah. No. You averaged 17. Are 17. you sure? Yeah. Was that my junior, my junior year? Your last year, 17. I thought okay. it was overall 17. I'm going to look it up right think now. Think about this. We ran plays for our players back then, Jeff. And yep. we give we give the best players two plays, say, and the other players one. But well, Charles was one of the players that had two plays, but w- we could go to the other guy more because Charles could rebound his misses, and the other guy could not re- rebound Charles's misses. Good point. Charles was Charles was an incredible rebounder. He could go from one side of the goal and get the rebound on the other side. You don't see many people that can rebound like that anymore. All right, I got the stats in front of you. Ready? What Here, is let's it? Go. Sonny, you're off. 15.1. Junior year, 15.1. Okay. I thought he was 17. Hey, oh, hey, Jeff. Uh, hey, you know, Jeff, Jeff, one of my greatest accomplishments uh, it was my third year at Auburn. So, like, in high school, my, my junior and senior year, we lost, bare, like, less than five games my junior and senior year. And every time we lost, we cried. So I go down to Auburn, and I remember it vividly because I tell this story all the time. When I talk when people ask me about accomplishments in my life, so you know you start off with the cupcake schedule, and then we finally lose a game, and I'm crying. And it might have been one of my teammates, Alvin Mumford, or somebody I can't remember who. Might have been Eric Stringer. Says, "Dude, what's up? You all right?" And they and I said. We lost. And they're like, are you crying? And I said, yeah. <laughs> when we lost, every time we lost in high school, it was traumatic. I mean, like I said, I think we lost five games my junior and senior year. And they were all big games. And, it, and obviously, we were devastated. And I remember the guy said, dude, we never win around here. And I said, what? He said, dude, we, we have never been 500 here. And I remember going back to the dorm and I was steamed. And the next day, I tell the guys, guys, this shit's going to stop right now. We're going to start winning. I said, I'm, t- I'm telling y'all right now, we're going to start winning. And we changed. We started working harder. We started practicing better. And that year, my first year, we finished, I think, 500. 
My next year, we finished about four or five games over 500. Now, we thought we had a chance of making the NIT, and we barely missed it. In my third year, we made it to the tournament. And I tell people, out of all the things I've done in my life, getting, getting number one, getting my high school team to the state tournament they had never been. Um, my high school, my high school had a, they got, they got upset in the playoffs every year. Yeah. And I got us to the state tournament two years in a row. And then getting Auburn to the NCAA tournament, I tell people that's probably one of the most powerful things that I talk about in my life. Sonny, what, it what was, was big, and we went to the finals of the SEC tournament that year and lost it on a final shot. What was um, what was the most trouble Charles ever got into at Auburn? Can we tell that story? Whatever it is, is, is it an on oh, the record? Off the record? No, no. So, so, hey, hey, Jeff. No, 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 so, Sonny used to get Sonny used to get mad at me for for breaking the rim down. Remember back in those days, oh, the yeah. rim was. Yeah. So, so you do it all the time? Oh, just, to, yeah, yes. Every time I dunk, I pull it down. <laughs> this goes on for about an hour. I probably do it six times. <laughs> and finally, <laughs> the seventh time, Sonny grabs the ball and throws, hit me right in the chest and kicks me out of practice. <laughs> and, <laughs> I don't remember that one, did I? Yes. <laughs> I have told you not to break that damn rim down. Because um, in the old days, Jeff, you remember the rim just came, came, come, come, come down, and it stayed down till you clicked it back up. Yeah. Sonny, what, yep. what, what's, what's, your, what's your kind of favorite memory of, of coaching Charles? I, I, th I thought it was when we uh, – Finally, we made it to the finals of the SEC tournament, and we were going to win it. And Kenny Walker makes the final shot. But Charles, Charles carried us all through that. And I think the other biggest memory of Charles is in a game that we lost. We were playing Richmond in the NCAA tournament, and they're killing us in the first half early. But they're a good team. Johnny had Johnny what's called played in Johnny Newman played in the NBA. Yep number of years. Charles comes to me at the halftime. He said, coach, give me the ball. And we gave him the ball. And we went from being like 20 points down, 19 points down, whatever it might be, to losing by on the last second shot, didn't we, Charles? You help me out here. But Charles, yes. scored like, Charles scored 24, 25 points in the second half. I, I don't know the exact number, uh, but he, he put us on his back and carried us right. I thought that I, I learned something there, and I saw how good he really was many times before that. But I'd never seen anybody take a game over totally. And the, you can't take a game over unless your teammates join in and help. They got to help. So they came down the floor, and they threw the ball to him every time. And he scored every time. And we lost that game. We lost the game like on a one-point deal. Everybody said, how could you lose uh, to Richmond? Well, except for two players, their players are better than the ones we had. But if people uh, look so, at it now, uh, right, right. They're going to look at it different now, obviously. With yeah, yeah, they uh, they were really good, and I thought then that game right there showed me that Charles can win any game if we if he's if he's given the opportunity and handled correctly. Charles used to say to me, coming out of the dressing room, I think about this a lot. He used to say to me say to me, I'd cuss him get all over him. He said, coach, why don't you ever tell us we're going to win? You know, and I, I thought about that for a minute, too. For years, I thought about that. Do you remember saying that, Charles? I remember because, you, you, you know, that was another famous coach that said the same thing all the time. Like, well, if we don't do this, they can beat us. Even if the team are like, no, they can't beat us, coach. <laughs> no, they can't beat us. Just say, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and work on this and this and this. We're going to kick their ass and keep it moving. I think it might have been Lou Holtz. He's always, no matter who they play, yes. he's like, well, this, this team can beat us. Oh, so he can. Every game. Every, every game he holds. Every game. Yeah. It, was, it was, you know, sisters of the poor. It didn't matter who he was playing. You know, he would, he would always say that. 
I yeah. worked with I worked with Lou Holtz for a year. I know. Yeah. He was a head football coach at William and Mary when I got my start. I listened to everything he ever said. His legs were skinnier than mine. I never saw that before. It's the first <laughs> time I've ever seen anybody with legs skinnier than mine. What um what do you guys think of the new the the, the name image likeness and and kind of what's going on there? I know Chuck, you, I'm sure you've talked about this in, in several interviews. Do you think kids the the NCAA has said that they're gonna they're gonna enable name image likeness, but they're gonna have guardrails. They're gonna have guardrails. Are you? There's no guard. Hey, first of all, that, that, hey Jeff, there's no guardrails. No, you can't guardrail it. Right. I hate it for the simple fact is there's only a couple players on every team that can sell their likeness. Right. Uh, I think there's gonna be a great resentment uh, because the other players work just as hard as the big name player. I always use the football analogy. They only going to buy the quarterback's jersey, the running back's jersey, and maybe a wide receiver. So True. they're going to sell their jersey. So those guys going to make great money. They probably going to get a car deal. Yeah. But if I'm a big, fat offensive lineman and I'm actually doing all the work for the running back and the quarterback and I'm not getting a dime, you don't think I'm gonna be pissed? I, I, don't, I don't. That that really bothers me. And like I say, what's gonna happen now is these small schools. If I'm a good player, I'm gonna say, wait, I'm gonna make a lot more money if I go to Kansas, and it's not, in, instead of going to Missouri State. I mean, cause that Missouri State, no disrespect, they're not gonna be on TV. So if I'm, I'm only gonna get to sell my likeness for six months. I'm only going to go to the schools that's going to be on television. I think it's going to really hurt competitive balance, number one. But secondly, it's going to be a great resentment among the players. Like, like, let's, take, um, let's take Auburn this year. That's just hypothetically. Okay. Like the best player on the team was Chuma – not Chuma, that was last year. Yeah. Uh, what's, what's the Isaac, young kid? Isaac, Isaac Okoro. People are going to buy Isaac's jersey. Sure. But they're not going to buy anybody else on the team jersey. No. So no. Isaac going to make some money. He, Isaac probably going to get a car deal. Number one, bless him. But I think that's going to be a great resentment among his teammates. Like, damn, this dude, he got a nice car. Yeah, he's McCormick. Making, he's gonna... Javon McCormick's not going to get anything, right? Like, no, he, no, he's not, gonna, no. He, he might get a few hundred bucks to, to go to a party or for but, but he's not gonna get real money. He's not gonna right. get real money. So I think but 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 this is all the NCAA's fault. That goes back to our conversation earlier. Listen, uh Mark Emmer's got to grow up and realize, like, yo, a guy's getting an extra pair of shoes, nothing wrong with that. Right. Right. If, a, if we if this guy's having dinner with somebody or he played in some summer league, don't suspend him for ten games. Right. Like we need to start using way more common sense. But uh, to get back to your point, Jeff, I hate the likeness thing. Interesting. Interesting. I do, too. I feel the same way about that. I really do. I don't think that they've done anything to keep the level of what a kid receives down through the lesser player. You know, you can have a lesser player that's given, giving to the other player to make him better. Yeah. And he gets nothing. I don't, I, I don't, I'm the same way he is about that. The other thing I worry about is, all right, we'll take you for, for example, Charles. You can set up, let's say you set up an LLC. All right, let's say they have, you can outbid or anybody. I'll give you a better one. Let's give you an even better one. Damon Stoudemire is a head coach of Pacific right now. I don't know how much money he's got in the bank, but my guess is he's got a lot of money in the bank. If he wants yes. to go legally and he's got a buddy of his who owns a car dealership down the street, why can't he tell that guy, give him some money, now that's, I guess, illegal, but whatever. You're, what I'm saying is basically you can pay these kids whatever you want. Bruce Pearl could do it through you. You could set up an LLC and you could go out, Charles Barkley Incorporated, and go buy the best players in America and outbid everybody if you wanted and bring Auburn a national title and go get the best players. Yeah, see, I, I think your point is 100% correct. We're going to have the haves. First of all, we already have the haves and the have-nots. After this pandemic, which 
don't shouldn't even come into play. After this pandemic, we really gonna have the haves and have nots. And, and like I say, if if I'm an 18 year old kid with a mom and dad, and they says, well, you gotta go to college for six months, and but you get your likeness. Well, wait, I gotta go to a big school. Right. I'm gonna make more money at a big school. I'm gonna get more national exposure, and like. That's just common sense. And like I say, I think it's going to hurt competitive balance. And I feel bad, man, because, see, what really bothers me, Jeff, is most of these kids are black. And and we have, we telling these black kids, oh, a free education doesn't matter. A free education really does matter. It's a really big deal. Only a couple of these guys going to be able to sell their likeness and their image. And I always try to look at the big picture. Man, all these young black kids, man, who get a free education, number one, we got to make sure they take advantage of it. But this notion that, like, let's change the whole, let's throw the baby out with the bathwater just to appease three guys. Think about this. There's only three high school players that went to the G League. Right, right. Three. But all of a sudden, like, well, we got to scrap the whole college system. I'm like, no, we don't. Right. We got three guys that's going to go to the G League. We still got hundreds and hundreds of thousands of other players going to do it the other way. But because we, we, they, the NCAA overreacts to everything and they're not progressive, it drives me crazy. I'm afraid we're going to have more next year, though, Charles. I am afraid that if Jalen Green goes number one in the draft, and Adam Silver has deep pockets and says, "Why not? I'm going to pay all these kids 250. Can he get Can he get 25 of the top 100 kids next year? I, I don't know. I am a little bit. Those who say, and, and I agree, I've said it. Listen, college basketball was fine without LeBron. Okay, it was fine. It survived. We did fine. But if you start losing more and more, the talent pool was not great this year. And if you lose, it's gonna you're gonna lose 10 more because the the Eventually, the rule's probably going to go in the place where kids can go out of high school again. So you're going to lose between 5 and 10 every year. That's okay. But if you start losing 25, and that's where I don't get why Adam Silver is doing this, does he really think it's a better way than college to be prepared for, for the No, no. I think, I think that the agents are in his ear uh, because he, he okay. has no obligation to college basketball. Right, but he's right. got he's but he has an obligation to the agents to a certain degree, the and I think that's the problem. The but agents the owners, are running running the league now. But why would the owners don't want kids coming out of high school? The players don't want kids coming out of high school. The veteran players who want to stay in for another year. So who the hell wants this rule? Is is my my question? Just giving in to the agents. That's that's just my personal opinion. If, hey, listen. First of all, I hate it. I I wish my personal opinion. I would like guys to stay in college for two years. Me too. Me too. I think that would I think that would help college. That would help the pros because your what you just said is interesting and true. These guys ain't gonna help the NBA next year. Uh, mm -hmm. Listen, people look at LeBron. First of all, if you go back to even Kobe Bryant, as great as he was, he struggled early in his career, and he's on and he's on the Mount Rushmore. Same thing with Kevin Garnett, who's a great player. He struggled. LeBron's the only player in my thirty some years in the NBA who was ready for the NBA when he came in. The rest of these kids are not even close to being ready. It hurts our product in the NBA, and clearly it's hurting college. But like I say, the NCAA's got to take some blame for it too, Jeff, because, listen, so, like suspending this Wiseman kid because Penny gave him $5,000 way before he was the coach in Memphis, I might add, too. Yep. I mean, give me a break. And, and, and listen, I get it. it. It's against the rules. But but ultimately, listen, like you said, they've got to figure out what are they willing to do here. You know, if, if a kid needs money to pay or his family needs money to pay for their electricity bill, like that should be legal. Like that, those are the things I don't understand. Right. I mean, AU coaches, they help these kids when they don't have money. Why is that wrong? Why is that not OK? Well, because. The, the, the rules are archaic. Uh, and Mark, Mark Emmert, listen, nobody uses the flip phone anymore for a reason. Nobody uses the typewriter anymore for a reason. Everything has to change. 
Uh, and the NCAA, first of all, I never talk bad about them because I understand, man, I, I want these young black kids to get that free education. You know, you know, I, and it, what's one thing that bothers me, I got all the guys on TV who are friends of mine who probably got screwed a little bit by the system. Sure. Like, yeah, they would have sold merchandise. They would have had a great likeness. But I'm saying, like, guys, what about the rest of the guys? You know, I know that, yeah, you had to go to college and you didn't make any money. But now you go, you, first of all, all of them went on to the NBA, myself included. And, like, I, I'm like, yo, man. Can you just look at the big picture? Let's, more kids are not going to go to the NBA than going to go to the NBA. Why, why aren't we worried about them? We're going to change the whole system for a couple of guys. That's what drives me crazy. And, and why give up on them? We, we got this G League thing. Why give up on the thought of trying to show them that college is better? You know, I get it. Some kids don't want to go to school. You, it sounds like you didn't want to. I didn't want to go to school at Arizona. I went to about 50% of my classes. You didn't yeah. want to go to your classes at Auburn, but you went, right? You, you, people made you understand that at the end of the day, it was the best for you down the road in your life to have a college degree. But also just the college. I like the college experience. That too. Yeah. Like, of course. You know, yes. you know, I actually talked to probably 20 people today, that not just players. 20 people I went to class with or who developed a friendship when I was at Auburn, uh, going to gymnastics, uh, going to swimming events, going to football games, obviously. Like, stuff like that. Like, you're going to drop a 17, 18-year-old kid and says, you're going to play in the G League in L.A. Okay, you're going to go practice in the morning. What the hell is this 17, 18-year-old kid going to do for the rest of the day? Right. Nothing. Instead, probably get in trouble. Like I say, and he's game. probably he got to move his family to L.A. to eat up the rest of that two hundred thousand dollars. Crazy man. What, what, are you guys, what are you guys up to now, Sonny? What, what do you have you been uh, pretty much locked in and and uh, not able to do anything? What have you been up to? Pretty much locked in. We uh, and I think people have done that pretty much in Auburn, uh, yeah. but we. Uh, there's not much getting out for 83 years old. <laughs> hey, there's not much getting out for 40, 48 years old either here in Boston. So, uh, Charles, I want to know, are, are, are you wearing pants right now or no? I'm wearing pants. You know, Jeff, I use this as a chance to, you know, you can't do anything. So I made a couple of rules. I can only drink on Friday and Saturday. Uh, I, 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 can, I work out twice a day. Do you? Really, uh, and I and I play golf three days a week. You know, I, I've tried to use this in a positive way, yep. and it's been. It's, it, listen, I, I'm not gonna complain, man, because you got so many people out here who died, or who are sick. Uh, so I'm not gonna complain at all. I don't. My only problem is, man, I, I I want the NBA to make a decision one way or the other. That's it. Um, are you in shape now? Are you like? How much oh, have I, I, I'm, in, I'm in 57 year old shape. <laughs> hey, there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing, nothing wrong with that. Right? I'm 94 year old shape. <laughs> but the diet, has the diet been hard? To, to, I mean, you're working out twice a day. Are you eating right? Too? No, no, the diet's been easy. The diet's been easy. My wife yeah. is cooking at 37, so I've, I've been on a diet ever since. <laughs> I, you didn't that, hear that's, me. I said, that's the hardest been part. On <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not hard. We, uh, Jan and I are pretty much retired. We eat out more than anything else. So now we just go pick it up. Yeah, you know, no. they're handing it out to go by. So it's nothing's changed for us. I'm, uh, I'm still staying active. I'm going to do the games on the radio for Auburn. I enjoy that. The reason I do, everybody asks me, I do it because I get a front row seat. If I, if I weren't doing it on the radio, I'd have to sit way up. And when you, uh, older you get, the closer to the court you want to be. <laughs> oh, oh, Bruce, Bruce will put you – no, Bruce will put you – even if you stop doing the radio, he'll put you down low. I, I He's smarter than that. Come on. Uh, no, I'd have to get Gus Bells on to do it. I don't think Coach, Coach Pearl could pull that off. That's <laughs> the way you remember that, Charles. Charles, hey. Charles, you say which was not true. 
he used to say that they'd feed the football player steak, and when we got over there, they'd have it changed by hamburgers for the basketball team. But it's no longer like that, I don't believe. Do you? It's not like that anymore, thank goodness. All right, la last thing, last thing before I let, let you go, Charles. Uh, watching the last dance, did you watch them both last night or no? I did not. You didn't watch I'm last. I, I'm last dance out, brother. Are you? You really are? Yeah, man. I mean, to talk about it every single – no, no, I'm saying I, I just have gotten – I watched the first three episodes, uh, yeah. six episodes, but – That was it. I'm just, I'm just tired of it mentally. You know what I enjoy? The best part for me is, uh, is actually watching Michael show emotion. Uh, they showed him actually, actually like in tears um, after, after winning the t one of the titles, uh, when he came back from baseball that first one. Yeah. And then they showed uh, Gary Payton talking some trash, and they showed, they showed it to Michael. You've seen it in a couple of the episodes where they show him on the iPad what Gary yeah. Payton uh, was saying, and he just kind of laughed at him. He's like, yeah, the glove. Um, ima uh, hey, imagine that. I know. I know. It's just, you know, like for me, again, uh, I grew up, you know, like I said, I'm 48, so I grew up in yeah. the problem of you and Michael and, and all that. So um, I enjoy it because – Frankly, there's nothing else on, number one. I've watched all the damn shows I can watch. I can't watch Ozark again. Uh, or hey, go to hey, have you did Billions? You know what? We, we started Billions, and I think it was more my wife. might have been me. I, I got to give it another shot. I, I'm loving Billions. Are you? All right. All right. We'll go yeah. Billions again. I never – how about this one? I've never watched The Wire, The Whole Wire. Me either. You haven't either? Nope. Everybody's you gotta watch West. West. You gotta watch westerns, fellas. Westerns, westerns. 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 westerns.